Good morning, good morning. Welcome back to the Arise Bible Study and Fellowship. We are thankful that you are here today and we are thankful that this is the day the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. I am Pastor Stephen and I'm excited that you're watching this video today. Today we're going to continue our study on the fall and the promise and what God is doing in the earth even now uh, according to his will. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and let's open up with prayer and we'll jump right into it. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for waking us this morning, clothed in our right minds and a reasonable portion of health and strength. But most importantly, Lord, with a willing mind to start our day with you. If we had a thousand tongues, we couldn't thank you enough. Lord, we're asking you to get into this Arise Bible study this morning touch Pastor Stephen in a special way, and let us not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. We thank you for everyone that's on the line and those who are coming on. Bless each one of us individually and bless us collectively. And God, let everything that we do and say today be to your glory and to your honor. It's in the mighty, marvelous, matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Evelyn. Do appreciate that. Um, and so what we want to do is, as we are moving forward in our Bible study, we want to remember why Arise even came to be. I want to start at the beginning because God uh, has, a, has a plan that he is unfolding in the world, uh, not just in the world, but in our lives. And, um, and so he put on my heart uh, back in January to begin this Bible study. Um, and he woke me up early in the morning. So I was the first to arise basically. And he did that for almost four weeks straight. And he just poured into me what his will was. And what he said to me was, um, he wants his children to come to him. He said that he wants us to help restore hope in the hearts of his children and bring them to meet with him on his holy mountain. And for those of you, this might be your first time watching us. And we say, welcome to the arise family. Uh, welcome to our family. Um, and, um, and so he said, what must be done must be done quickly because time is growing short. And since that time, we have actually had a war break out in Russia. And um, and it's amazing how God's, of course, God's timing is perfect. But even in our hearts, how we've been prepared daily by coming back to the Rise Bible Study, 8 a.m. Uh, and we've been doing it Monday through Saturday, uh, 8 a.m. every day, uh, ever since January. January 31st was our first uh, our first uh, video. So, um, but how our hearts and minds have been stayed on God and not so much on the world. Like every day we've been coming back and been able to get into God's word to keep our hearts and minds right before the Lord. Although these things, although, although these things are happening in the world, God through his word has given us uh, an assurance in our foundation that uh, no weapon formed against us will prosper. No matter what the enemy has a plan to do, God has a plan that will override that plan. And uh, we've been watching from Genesis uh, chapter 1 all the way up to where we are now. We're in Genesis chapter 11. How we've been seeing God's plan unfold, even though man fell. Um, and that's where we begin our whole journey. We want you to take notes. We certainly want you to go backwards uh, and, and watch the videos, the first videos, and then come forward so you can get the foundation. We have covered a whole lot of ground in studying God's words so that we can know who he is and know who we are in him. Um, but one thing that we understand is that we came from God, that this earth, now that we're here on this planet, uh, even though Adam and Eve sinned, this was created uh, by God's purpose and divine order. And he intends for it to be something special in the end times. He wants to fix, and he is fixing the results of sin from Adam and Eve. But one thing that we must understand is this, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14, is that this world, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to, to a home yet to come. And that's what the whole story, this whole story is about. We are looking forward towards God's will being done, God repairing what was broken and what was destroyed by Adam and Eve's disobedience in the garden. God's desire was to walk with his creation. We are God's image bearers. Imago Dei is what it's called. Uh, we are God's image bearers. We're made in his image and after his likeness. And his desire was to walk with us, in fellowship with us, um, in fellowship with us from from the beginning and he will do so in the end so uh we're going to see that unfold but we do know that it, it is because of uh the judgment that he right rightfully because he's righteous 
had to place on Adam and Eve, even though he loved them, there's still a consequence for sin. And we know that the wages of sin is death. And we cover that. We cover that Adam and Eve in the garden, when they fell, were cast out of the garden in judgment, and death occurred in the garden. There were animals that had to be sacrificed in order to cover their nakedness. God had to put uh, angels um, to block the path with fiery swords, and it's, and it's blocked until this day. Um, and we know it is a result of the fall of man in the garden, and God's intent is to restore that. He actually said that in the garden, that he was going to, through the seed of the woman, bring someone that would destroy Satan's power on the earth and crush his head. And even though he would bruise his heel, which means that he would have a chance to hurt his body, he wouldn't destroy who God was sending. And so that's the story that we're, we're following. That's what the Bible actually outlines from Genesis to Revelation. It's a story of redemption. It's a story of us being redeemed back to God and being placed back into right standing with him through God's plan in Genesis. And uh, and so God actually prophesied that this one would come. And the whole Bible is the story of from the fall to the restoration, from Genesis to Revelation, God's plan unfolding. And so we're following that storyline from, from Adam to uh, his son, Seth, and from Seth moving forward to Noah. And these are videos that we've already covered, so please, Go back and, and watch the past video so that you can hear the wonderful way God's unfolding his will in the earth. Uh, despite man's attempt for the continuing sin, God's mercy is still greater. Matter of fact, the scripture says where, where sin abounds, there's grace must grace much more abounds. So God's grace can always cover and redeem us from sin. Um, and so we see that from uh, from Adam to Shem, his son, to Noah, Noah became the next person that God spoke to, gave his will to, to establish his covenant in. And we know because of the story of Noah that the um, the hearts of men were waxing waxing uh, evil every day. And God decided to destroy every living thing that had breath in the earth. And then Noah and his wife and his three sons, Ham, Sham, and Japheth went into the ark with their wives. And the animals did too. And then they were preserved for this new beginning. And so right after that, we followed through to what was going to be, it was called the chronology. And we actually looked at the chronology, and that video was beautiful. You you definitely need, if you watch any video, you need to watch the video on the chronology uh, of, of from Adam to Abraham. And we looked at the lifespans of men and how God, through Adam, who lived 930 years, if this is your first time watching this video, I'm going to give you a little short lesson on this. He lived 930 years, and if you look right here, that's the end of his life, and look how long he lived. He lived all the way until... Uh, Methuselah and then also Lamech and Lamech was the father of Noah right Lamech was the father of Noah and we know right at this time of Noah there was a um, there was a flood that came and judgment came so judgment happened in the garden then judgment happened again uh, with with right after Lamech died Noah with the flood right and um, and we know that after Noah Noah had Shem his son that right after that they sinned again it was like sin just kept happening over and over again and even in their arrogance they decided that they were going to build a tower uh even though god told them to be fruitful and multiply and spread all over the earth they decided not to do that they wanted to stop build a city unto themselves make a tower up to god to prove that they are just as high and as powerful as god is and god had to destroy that uh and destroy it because that was not his will for them to do that and and they weren't going to spread across the earth until he had to disperse them and he had to confuse their languages and that's when man spread all across the earth and so we're going to pick up that story we're going to get into genesis chapter 11 we covered the tower of babel uh as always we're in um biblegateway.com that's one of our fa favorite bible study sites um and websites and so we want to get into the tower of babel we cover this the arrogance of man and how god had to come down and confuse their language genesis chapter 11 we got through that and then he started talking about the descendants from Shem, right? And that's Noah's son. And Shem, you know, we went through how he had sons and they had sons and they just kept rolling forward. He had sons and daughters. Um, one of the first times it actually brings it up, it says sons and daughters uh, in this chapter. And it says, and Shem lived after um, after he fathered our fact sad 500 years and had sons and daughters. And, um, and that's another thing that we talked about is how the Bible honors women. It doesn't dishonor women. Um, and though in the past, you kind of heard because of Eve's fall in the garden, it seems like there's been a lot of pressure and a lot of guilt placed on women, which is not true, not according to God's will. We are his children, men and women. God made mankind, which was man and woman, right? So we're all his creation. We're all his image bearers. Um, and, and I was actually speaking with Evelyn earlier. We were talking about how when you walk in the spirit, God says, if you walk in the spirit, 
For those who walk in the spirit gave them power to become the sons of God. And that's us, men and women. That's us. Um, and so we, we honor women, uh, especially here on the Rise Bible Study. Um, and it moves forward. The story moves forward. And what we want to take a look is terror, right? So we get back, and I need to go back one more step. Um, so we see Noah was born. And Noah had Shem, and Shem had Arphaxad, and then Arphaxad had Selah. Selah had Eber. Eber had Peleg. Uh, Peleg had Ru. Ru had Serug. Serug had Nahor, and then Nahor had Terah, and Terah had a son named Abraham. And so we know we went from Adam to Seth, and then Seth all the way to Noah, key character, new beginning, from Noah all the way now to Abraham. And that's where we're going to pick up and we're going to continue, and we're going to look at how God is rolling his will out to do exactly what he said in Genesis, as when he said from uh, the woman's seed will come one that will destroy uh, Satan's power and what he did in the, in the garden and tricking man into sin. And so we pick up in verse 27. We are in Genesis chapter 11. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram. See it says Abram. That was his name originally. Abram. Uh, Abram, uh, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Ishka. Now Sarah was born, was barren. She had no children. So Abram's wife could not have children, is what that's saying. Verse 31, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son, uh, his son Abraham's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there, the days of Terah was 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. All right, so we see the movement here and how God is placing them in a specific location. And we see that they have now settled. Uh, it says Chaldeans to go into the land of Haran, but when they came to Haran, they settled there. So we see that uh, Abram's family is now in Haran, and then his father dies. Now, it's usually at the death of the parent that something, something happens in the earth that God does, a new thing. Uh, that God does. And so what we want to do is we're going to move forward into the next chapter. Uh, we're going to go to chapter 12. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 12. Whoops, what did I do? Okay, Genesis, and we're going to go to chapter 12. And this is when God calls Abram, right? So we're going to see, and we're, we're in the English Standard Version. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, uh, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, we're going to slow down. We're going to take a look at this. Because when we read the scripture, we're not just reading the story about something that happened to other people. That's not why we read the scriptures. We read the scriptures so that we can understand who God is, his character, his nature, how he thinks, what he does, and how he interacts with his creation. And we'll see a lot of that right here in these first three verses of chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country. So the first thing we see, God is speaking to his people. God is speaking to his chosen one. And God is always speaking. The question is, are we listening? God has a plan for your life. He created you for a purpose. Even today, you watching this video, and whether you're watching us live right now or you're watching the recording, this is right now March 5th, 2022. I mean, you could be watching this a year, two years, 10 years later. We don't know. But if you're watching it right now, God has a plan for you. He wants you to know that you lo you're you loved and you're created for a purpose. And so he wants you to see that in the scripture because many are called, but few are chosen. Now, the chosen ones get to hear his voice. He says, my sheep hear my voice and another they will not follow. So we see right here, now the Lord said in his capital L-O-R-D, and so we're talking about Jehovah, Yahweh, our God, right? Said to Abram, go from your country. Direction. God gives direction. And I think that's the heart of most of uh, the believers, the followers of Christ. We're like, God, just tell me what to do. Like, God, just where do I go? Who do I talk to? What do I need to do? I want to walk in your divine will. And that's the right attitude. Even Jesus modeled that in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, you know, if there's another way for this cup to pass, he was days away, a, a day away from being crucified. And and he said, um, I, he said, not my will, but your will be done. Even though he did not want to die that horrible death of being 
you know, tortured and then put on the cross, um, he still prayed, not my will, but your will be done. That's a perfect prayer for the believer. All right. So make, that, make sure you write that down and keep that in your mind, because no matter what happens in your life, you might try to figure things out on your own and people might try to give you advice, but you have to quiet all those voices down and get before your father because he loves you. And you have to say, I know you're holy and you're righteous. And I want your will done because your will is perfect. So your will be done. No matter what path I have to take in my life to get to your will to be done, I'm committing in my heart to say yes to you, Lord. Matter of fact, there's a song called Yes by Shekinah Glory. You should Google that. Actually, you should go to YouTube and write that in and listen to that song. That's our foundational song. We play it every time before we start the broadcast. Uh, and so that will inspire you. So, um, all right, we're going to move on. And your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Sometimes God will call you away from the thing that is familiar so that he can take you to your destiny so that you can walk in purpose. And that's uncomfortable because it's everything you know, especially back in these days, that was his protection. That was his comfort. That was his time of, of, of uh, that was his place of, of uh, unity with his, his family. And, and he's, God's telling him to get up and leave. Now, this is another thing. When God speaks, it's a test of your faith. God is not always going to tell you to do something easy. Oftentimes, it's something that sounds uh, incredibly hard. And um, it, it'll make you go, okay, is that God? I don't know if you've ever been there where it's something you hear a voice to tell you to do something. You're like, okay, is that, I don't know if that's God. And I'm, I'm not. we're always transparent here on the rise. And so I, I'm just going to share what happened with me. And, um, and so... I, uh, I remember one time I heard a voice tell me uh, inside my head, not audible, because it's not always, always audible. Um, but I heard a voice tell me to pray. It told me to pray. And I remember I said, I said, pray. I said, is that, is that God or is that the devil? Boy, the Holy Spirit came so fast to me. He was like, would, would the devil tell you to pray? Sometimes you just got to use common sense. Prayer is communication with God, so the devil will absolutely not tell you to pray, okay? He's going to tell you not to pray. So that was a, a nice little whoop, and I needed to remind me of whose I am, all right? So uh, so I just want to encourage you in that. All right, so in verse 2, and I will make of you a great nation. Let me stop right here. See, this is what happens when you slow down. You can actually see God. God said, look, Abraham, I'm talking to you. I love you. We're in communication. I need you to do something for me. I need you to go from everything you know. I'm going to send you somewhere. And verse 2, and I will make of you a great nation. He's like, look, I'm going to bless you. And I will bless you and make your name great. God says, if you're obedient to do what I tell you to do, I am going to bless you. And in his word, he says, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, if you're not diligently seeking him, then you won't truly walk in his absolute blessing. That's a fact. He says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. All right, so what does that look like? I'll tell you what that looks like. Let me just let's just let's just say that you were given a five carat diamond by your great great grand grandmother. Five carat diamond. And you had it in a nice little box and you had it in your house. And a, about four years later, it just dawned on you that you haven't looked at that diamond lately. And you don't even know where it's at. Now all of a sudden you didn't you didn't look back for four years, you done had people come over your house, you didn't have family reunions, you didn't have cookouts. People walking in and out of every room. And you're like, wait a minute, where's that diamond at? This is what diligence looks like. On that day, you stop everything. You don't go to work. You don't do nothing. You tear that house apart from the top to the bottom. You move and open up and, and shift everything around. You open every drawer. You look at every closet, every box. You're looking for that diamond. And you're doing it diligently. See, that's what the diligence is. The diligence is, isn't, let me just open up the closet and look in and close the door. And a lot of us do that. I'm going to read my daily scripture and we think that that's enough. Or I'm going to, I'm going to listen to my gospel music in the morning and we think that's enough. No, that's not diligence. That's awareness and that's good, but good is the enemy of great. I heard that once and I can't remember who said that, but good is the, Evelyn probably knows, but good is the, the enemy of great. We have to give great effort to pressing into God, which we do every day here on the Rise Bible Study and Fellowship. Every day what we say is that we're pressing up God's holy mountain to meet with him. And we've been doing it now since January 31st, Monday through Saturday, every day at 8 a.m. So we're so we're so much further up God's mountain, it's, it's glorious. And a lot of us have testimonies of what God has done in our life and things that he's revealed to us through the studies. 
And now that you're watching, you're part of the Rise family, you get to join in with us right where we are on the mountain to keep on walking. All right, so let's walk towards God's blessings for our life and be obedient. Now, verse 3. Look what God says. I will bless those who bless you. I, stop right there. Come on now. When you talk to people and interact with people, you need to let them know. When they bless you, you have to let, especially people who don't know about God, you have to let them know. You, you don't even know what you did. Like, what, what did I do? I just gave you something extra. I gave you something I, was, I wanted to give you. He said, no, you bless me, and I'm a child of God. And he's made a promise to those who are chosen that he will bless those who bless me. God's about to bless you. And look what he says. And, and he says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will do what? This is no joke. I will curse. Now, some people will say, "Well, that's Abram. He was talking to Abram. He wasn't talking to he wasn't talking to you two thousand seven hundred years later. He wasn't talking to you. He was talking to Abram." No. What we see is that God has His chosen people that He gives instructions to that if they're obedient, He will bless. And God's character is those who bless His chosen, He will bless, and those who do not bless His chosen but curse them, He will curse. It's a fact. And in you. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, that's a direct promise to Abram. Because we know as we move forward in the story, for those who know, that God's going to do something through him because of what he said in the garden. See, this is the thing. It's impossible for God's word to return unto him void. When God said in Genesis that from the woman's seed will come one that will crush your head and you will bruise his heel, he knew because he's the Alpha and the Omega, right? The beginning and the end of all things. He's omniscient, which means he's all-knowing. He knew he was going to talk to Abraham once Abraham was born. He, he knows his plan. We don't know his plan. We don't know God's plan. God says, my ways are higher than your ways. It's important that we understand we're not God. We came from God, but we are not him. Okay? We are not him. Matter of fact, Jesus himself, and this is going to mess up your theology, your, your understanding of God. Jesus himself didn't even know everything God knows. Why? Because he said it time and time again. He says, I do what my father says to do. He says, the time of my return is not given for me to know. Only the Father knows that. He kept saying that. Even in the garden, when he said, not my will, your will be done, he was saying, look, you know better than me. I, look, I got a whole different plan I want to do right now. But you know what? Because you're my Father, because I know who you are, I'm going to give you place in my life and let your will be done, not my will. I'm telling y'all, don't, don't get confused. People think Jesus was somehow the omniscient God on the earth. No, it's not so. Matter of fact, it says that Jesus learned obedience through suffering learned uh, obedience if he's omniscient he don't have to learn nothing so in order for him to be touched in every way that we were touched he had to come just like we are blank with, with some things we just don't understand they have to go through getting revelation through suffering and learning obedience that's our lord and that's why we can follow him because he didn't come down here like superman he came down here as a man to show us how to endure this life and how to glorify god even in the midst of trials and tribulations so we give him glory for that. We just thank, thank God for sending Jesus as an example. And he is our Lord and Savior. He is the Messiah. The Jewish nation says he's the Mashiach Amashuach. So, so he is the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. Yeshua Amashiach is the name. Yeshua Amashiach. All right, so verse 4. Let's see how Abram responds. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Have you done that? Has God told you to do something? Have you already went? And done what the Lord told you to do. And look, if you haven't, don't. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So don't don't condemn yourself. What you got to do is realize, oh, I haven't done that yet. And then go do it. Whatever it is, repent. Say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've delayed. I've had some disobedience. All right. But whatever it is God told you to do, go do. Just just get it done. Go back and do it. Fix it. Apologize. Restore. You know, and and, and do the things God's told you to do. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Lot went with him. Don't forget this. This is important. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now, now let's, let's, let's understand. Lot was his nephew. Lot was his nephew, not his son. Okay? Because remember, Sarai could not have children. So Lot, uh, Abraham took Lot. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Oh, let me stop right there. Look at this. This is another thing about, especially here in America. Now, this is not the, way, the same way in the Asian countries. But in America, they say if you're like in your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you, you're old. You just need to retire. need to back up. need to stop doing stuff. No, in the Bible, that's when life begins. That's when God puts you to work. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. 
Moses was 80 years old on the Mount of Sinai talking to God before God sent him to, to uh, Egypt to do all those things that he told him to do. So it doesn't matter your age. It's whatever call, God's called you to where you are. That's when you need to get busy. And Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. But we, we are definitely not passing over this right here. And Abraham, verse, four, verse 5, and Abraham took Sarah, his wife. He was supposed to do that. Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, God said nothing about taking extended relatives. He didn't. And all their possessions that they had gathered, right, all his stuff, and the people they had acquired in Haran. So uh, he had people that were his servants. He had a bunch of servants. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan, which God told him to go. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. And at the time, the Canaanites, the Canaanites were in the land. Now, the Canaanites, I'm telling y'all, there's some evil people. So we got to be careful. But I want to go back because what God told him to do is he, the Lord said, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. He told him to go. And, and, and Sarai is his wife, so they went. So he was supposed to go and Sarai was supposed to go and he was supposed to take the servants that he had with him. That's how that was supposed to be. But he was he was looking at uh, the fact that, you know, um, Lot's father had died and he was like, you know what, I'm going to take him with me. Now, you can imagine a man who has no, no children can look at his nephews and nieces and be like, we're going to treat you all like our children now, because especially since your parents are dead and we're barren, you know, like that. You got to be careful about familial relationships. Because sometimes you will put yourself in a position where God didn't tell you to be because of your own desires. And you haven't checked in with God. You got to be careful that you do and say what you need to in time according to God's will. Because you might derail what God has for your life because you're trying to be God in somebody else's life. Oh my gosh, that was good. I'm going to say that again. You might derail what God has in your life because you're trying to be God in someone else's life. Now, you can look to your past and see where you made decisions to do things that did not work out the way you thought. And you thought you were doing good, but you weren't doing God. You thought you were doing good, but you weren't doing God. We have to not be the Holy Spirit in people's lives. Stop speaking into people's lives when God didn't tell you to speak. Stop sharing your vision, the vision God's given you with people. God did not tell you to share your vision with. Stop inviting people to be a part of what God's called you to because God has not called them to it. I'm telling you, I'm speaking to somebody today. Be careful because those things are delays and derailments from purpose. God didn't tell you to add baggage to his promise to you. So be obedient. And it may look like sometimes there's a season where you are alone or, or where you're separated from. But it's okay because God has a will for their life just like he has a will for your life. So stop trying to add people to your life that's not supposed to be there. Okay? Very important. All right. So uh, when they came to the land, we're right here. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. And that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, here we go. God speaking again. When you're walking on the path to purpose, God will continue to be with you. God will be with you because you're being obedient. God and Abram and then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this, this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. That altar was not just for, for the Lord. That altar was a reminder to him and his descendants. So sometimes as God's moving you in purpose and God's doing a thing, you got to set up a reminder of what God has done to remind you of what, what God has done and also to remind your descendants. And the reminder comes in a season where you may forget. That's what reminders are all about. And so sometimes you have to build an altar or create a thing that will be a point of reference to you, whether you... You write it out and put it on a frame and stick it on the wall or whether you uh, build a, 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 in your yard a, a mound of stone so that every time you're in your yard, you look at that monument and say, you know what? That's the moment that God did such and such in my life. I remember that. Actually, one of my coaching clients, uh, business coaching clients, uh, we were talking and I was telling her that, you know, sometimes what you can do is you can um, go in your yard and you can get smooth stones or go to the river and grab some stones and bring them home. But you can stack them in a little stack and that's a monument. And, and it just dawned on me, you know, you could write, you could just have one stone, a big one, and you could put that as the base, and you could write the date and the moment what God did for you. You know, whatever the date is, and you could put God delivered me from such and such, or this is what he did in my family. Just write it on the stone. And then when something else happens, go get another stone, sit it on top, and write on there. And then every day you see that, you see that you're stacking, stacking a remembrance 
of what God's done in your life. That's a good thing. Uh, and there's other things you can do to remind yourself that can be visual uh, the pictures you can buy Christian things from a Christian bookstore and you can put that up and remember what God has done But the point is is to remember. That's what this is, is a model of to remember Verse 7 then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said said to your offspring look the promise is passing from Abraham's obedience into his descendants I will give this land so he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him from there He moved to the hill country of the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Beth with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, uh, and look at this Ai. We hear about Ai all the time now in this year of 2022, and they use it artificial intelligence is what it is. But Ai first was in the Bible, and there he built an altar to the Lord, an altar, and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. Now, what you what we got to see here is that Abraham is being obedient and still moving forward. Though he doesn't know where he's going. Come on now. Come on now. That's got to hit you down to your shy now now. How many of y'all are pressing every day moving forward and you have no clue where you're going? But you know you're being obedient. You're trying to be faithful. You're praying. You're fasting. You're praising. You're trusting God. You're walking in faith. No matter what storm or what wind blows at you. No matter what fire comes up around you. You're just pressing forward. Our tomorrows is in God's hands. He wants you to be obedient today. And that's all that's important. He's requiring in today for us to stand fast, for us to have faith, for us to be strong. Why? Because he's God. He's got it all covered. He's got it all covered. And we're going to see God's plan unfold. And, and we're going to see how God works through man, through Abram. Now, this is the thing. We went from Noah and his obedience to build an ark to Abram. So we saw how God preserved the people through Noah his family and restarted man, kickstarted the whole earth again with life through Noah. So what is God doing through Abraham, a Abram? And we know through the story of Moses, and this is kind of the thing, Moses, God would choose one person to do a great thing for all the people. And the promise was given to Abram that through you, I'm going to bless the whole world. What does that mean? How can one man, especially back in the Bible days when they don't have the internet and television and radio, how can one man traveling with his wife and his nephew and their servants bless the entire planet, everyone on the planet? So we want to see that and we want to understand that. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to jump right into, um, and you know we like to do this. We like to, um, Mars Hill produce these beautiful video, video clips to help reveal God's will. And so we're going to watch this real quick. And, uh, and this is really short. I'm going to share it again and pull up the sound. So make sure you turn your sound up so you can hear this. So I'm going to go ahead and share this. And then we'll continue right after we play this. Hopefully it'll play right. From among the nations of the earth, God called out a man who was known to us as Abraham. God told Abraham to leave his home and go to the land he would show him. Abraham did as God said, taking all his people and possessions. God promised that Abraham would possess this land and become the father of a great nation. And through him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. It was a peculiar promise for Abraham and his wife Sarah had no children of their own. But Abraham obeyed God just the same and led his people to the land of Canaan. Now Abraham and Sarah lived in Canaan for a long time, but they remained childless. Don't be afraid, Abraham. I am with you. Again, God spoke to him saying that his descendants would be like the stars of the heavens, too many to count. Abraham believed God, and God counted his faith as righteousness. I trust in you. Now I believe he will, he will bless us with a son. <laughs> but how could God's promise to Abraham be fulfilled? For Sarah to have a child seemed impossible. Rather than waiting on God and his timing, Sarah gave her servant Hagar to Abraham, and Hagar gave birth to a child named Ishmael. 
I name him Ishmael. <laughs> Eventually, just as God had promised, Sarah also bore a child from Abraham. A son. They called him Isaac. I have a son. I name him Isaac. What's he done? Take him away. They are brothers. And Sarah became bitter toward Hagar and Ishmael. Get out of my sight. Abraham was distressed. Abraham. But God told Abraham not to be troubled, for Ishmael would become the father of a great nation. And through Isaac, God would fulfill his promise to bless all nations. And the years passed. Now in those days, it was a custom of those who trusted God to sacrifice an animal as an act of worship. This practice dated back to the children of Adam and Eve, who most likely had heard of the animal that was slain to cover their father and mother. How would you make a burnt offering? And so it was one day that Abraham and his son prepared to make an offering to God. Abraham's son was now grown and probably had done this many times before. But this time was unlike any other. The day before, God had spoken to Abraham, telling him to take his son and offer him to God. Abraham was a man who obeyed God but what was he thinking and feeling now? The they had the wood and the knife. But where is the offering, his son asked. Abraham said, God will provide the lamb. The Lord himself will provide the lamb. And together they went to the appointed place. There they prepared the altar and arranged the wood. God had not yet provided another offering. So Abraham bound his son on the altar. Still, there was no other sacrifice. So Abraham lifted his knife to slay his son. Then there came from heaven a voice saying, do not lay a hand on the lad. <laughs> and there in the thicket was a ram caught by its horns. And so it was that God provided an offering in place of Abraham's son. This was a picture of the offering that God would one day provide for the sin of humankind. Woo. So we are thankful for Mars Hill producing that wonderful piece. And there's a lot that we're going to cover in there. We won't cover it today. I just wanted to give you this for the weekend. Have you think about that? Uh, because we're going to get into the rest of that story and see how God uses that as an example of what he's doing in the earth. Uh, and his plan for moving forward to bringing this one to pass that will come uh, through Abraham. Uh, through He went from Abram to Abraham. We're going to continue in that story. But that one who's coming... Uh, is being at this moment solidified in the physical realm so that it can happen in the spirit. And so this is it's a beautiful story of how God's creating the atmosphere and the environment on the earth to be able to do what he said uh, through mankind. So praise God. We're going to stop right there. And uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and share anything that stood out to you or any questions that you might have. Yes. One, I thought that Isaac was um, younger. 
I didn't know realize that he was fully grown. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's, it's it's thought that he was like in teenage years, like 14, 15, 16, something like that. Oh, okay, that fits. With, okay, and then I was wondering if in obedience, if you move forward in obedience, which we have and we don't know what um, sometimes we don't know what is going on or where we're going then what happens when for instance it's kind of complicated like with you moving forward and then things, things still come against you which challenges your your faith and your your call of whether you're doing the right thing and we've talked about how those struggles strengthen us, right? And how those struggles um, still causes us great distress. So for mm -hmm. those that are listening, you know, what should we do in those times? Great question. Um, so, and that's Sadia, if you guys have, don't recognize her voice, she's always dro dropping great questions. Um, but uh, there's two things. There's delay and there's disqualification. So in those times, your your disobedience will cause you to be delayed in your deliverance. If you're not doing God's will in the midst of trials, um, or it will disqualify you from your blessings. Uh, because then you, you've now caused God not to be able to bless you. He's not going to bless disobedience. So in those times, we are to be faithful. I, I've been taught that when you don't hear God's voice, then don't move. Just continue doing what he's already told you to do. And oftentimes, the reason why you don't hear God's instructions for your future is because you haven't done what God told you to do in your past. So you have to go back and see what's undone. Like, what have I not done yet? What am I not doing currently? But you have to hold on to your faith and your confession of faith. So in the midst of your trials, you have to understand that the trial isn't one thing. Oftentimes, it's a lot, lot of things. We can see, see that in the story of Job. One thing after another, after another, after another. You thought that was bad enough, and here comes one more thing, and then one more thing. And, and this all happened to him all on one day. And so that kind of shows you the succession of the attack of the enemy. Sometimes it's not just one punch. He wants to hit you with 18 body shots and then hit you with a head shot at the end, right? But this is the reality. No weapon formed against us will prosper, right? So that means no matter how long this lasts, God has a will for it. And this is what the enemy hates. In the midst of him giving his greatest shot, for you to smile and glorify God and praise him and start working harder for him. Oh, he hates that. He's like, I gave him my best shot. I gave her my best shot. Certainly me attacking her family was going to cause her to break. Wait a minute. Certainly me attacking her on her job was going to cause her to break. Wait a minute. I do my best shot and hit her in her health. Now, you know, she loved being healthy and I done hit her in her health. And she, what? Is she still praying and praising and serving? And that's what we had to do. When the enemy turns up his attack. We have to turn up our faith and action. The Bible says faith without works is dead. And and actually the arise came out of that very moment because we had been going through a lot last year and I was coming to the end of the year and I said, that's it. I am tired of going through. I'm t it's time for me to ri rise up. It's time for me to go higher. And I said, okay, so in order for me to go higher, all these attacks are happening. If you're going to fight me, I'm not going to stay on the ground. I'm going to get up and keep fighting. This is the thing though. You got to remember the Bible says, well, not the Bible, but it's, it's, it's understood that overcoming faith remembers past victories in that moment you got to remember what god has already done because of your obedience right and then you say well now even now i'm going to be obedient even though i don't feel like it the people around me are telling me to do the wrong things and you got to separate yourself from people sometimes in those seasons because because they love you they will tell you the easy way out right they will try to get you out of your pain as quick as possible right but you got to do what god's told you to do so even in the midst of your trials you got to remember that god has steps that are ordered from him and if you follow him right seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness his way of thinking his way of being and acting then all these things will be added unto you and so even yesterday that had to come to me because right now my wife and i need two cars we are carless <laughs> we're ubering and borrowing people's cars and all of that after after um doing a rise um beginning a rise and I'm telling y'all, coming to the new year, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this thing, and I'm going to be focused. And all of a sudden, my wife and I both were attacked. We got sick for 16 days. Both of us were both taken to the hospital in the ambulances, second, separate ambulances. And God used my sister and my niece to call me, to encourage me to call the ambulance because I was, 
I was so weak. I was about ready to see Jesus. I mean, I was I was ready. I'm like, okay, if this is it. I crossed the finish line. I've I run the race and kept the faith. I'm ready to go to my reward. And I had to be careful about that because God has so much more for us to do. Because right after that, when God healed us, I, I got on fire for the Lord because I said the enemy tried to kill me. Oh, you're not going to try to kill Stephen Walker and think that's going to be it. You don't piss me off. Now, now I'm going harder for the Lord. And so God's just been ever since then pouring into me and gathering people around me who have like faith. And we're all warriors in the spirit pressing through, but we're still going through tribulation. Right after that, my son's car broke down. Then my car broke down. Then my wife's car broke down. We're carless. But, but yet I'm serving him. I'm a pastor at a church. I teach three Bible studies. One of them goes for six days a week. I mean, you would think, and I actually had somebody say this to me once, that now this thing almost broke me. That person called me up. They love me. They called me up. They said, you know, I've been wondering about you. I was like, well, what's going on? They said, you know, you've been serving God all these years. You've been doing good. You're a good husband. You're a good father. Why is it that you're always under attack? Why don't you have what you need? Oh, my gosh, you're talking about throwing me sideways. I was like, now, that's a great question. It messed me up. Y'all don't even know how bad that messed me up. Because at that time, I was looking at people in the world who had houses and cars and families and vacations and money in the bank and no problems out partying, going on vacations around the world. And here we are, we're struggling. That's the, that's the voice of the enemy. Because one thing we know about our God is that he is good. And he is faithful. So we have to... In the midst of the trial, not try to understand. He says, lean not to your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And there's another scripture because this was other people say, well, there's another scripture that says, you know, in all you're getting, get understanding. And that's kind of confusing. No, it's not. The first scripture says, lean not to your own understanding. So in the midst of your challenge, don't try to understand it on your own. He says, in all you're getting, get understanding. That's his understanding the word of god says that this mind being you that's also in christ jesus so if we can get the mind of god in our situation which is and we've read it to glory in tribulation knowing this that the trying of your faith produces patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope make it you not ashamed because you can rightfully divide the word of truth we're the sons and daughters of god so trials just like we learned about jesus earlier that through suffering we learn obedience and it's a purpose for it we we would rather not have to go through all of this, but it's a part of God's process. So who are we to tell God, stop bringing trials into my life? Can I have a moment, Lord? Can I just, can I have a season of just no trials? Can I just have a moment to just enjoy my life? No, God is good and God is faithful. We want his will done. So um, hopefully that answered your question because that was a lot of talk. <laughs> yeah. Can you still hear me? So yeah. the last piece was we were reading the scripture about you know, the person who blesses you will be blessed. Mm. Um, and that those who, I guess, do harm will be cursed. So th that's Old Testament. I know that there have been many people who have tried to do me harm. And I look and, you know, they claim to be Christian. And honestly, I don't see them. I don't see them suffer. Not while I'm in their presence, um, while I'm, you know, still around them. And I've moved on after years and wondered, okay, did that happen? Um, and the other piece of that is, okay, so I'm a Christian. What if I actually do bad to someone? Do I want him to punish me, to curse me? Um, so what is the New Testament um, revelation or, you know, because that was the old covenant. So new covenant with that. Where, where are we? What should we believe? All right. So, again, great question. Um, so what we have to understand is the Old Testament is God's will concealed. The New Testament is God's will revealed, but all of it is God's will. So just because it's old don't mean it's done away with. Because Jesus came to, and he said, I didn't come to do away with none of the Old Testament. I came to fully fill it, to fulfill it. Right. So it, just because it's written in the Old Testament doesn't mean it's irrelevant, because if it's irrelevant, he wouldn't even had the New Testament Christians read the Old Testament. Right. So that's our foundation. Right. So that's we still have to listen and understand and reverence and respect everything in the Old Testament. And those promises and those those uh, revelations still are real for us in the New Testament. Jesus constantly quoted the Old Testament. Why? Because it's still relevant. So it's just because it's not on our side of his birth doesn't mean that somehow we don't adhere to it and doesn't apply to us. Um, so that's the first thing. The other thing is, you know, when it comes to the New Testament, 
the, the New Testament is filled with God's promises to protect protect us. Um, even though we are in a fallen world, we'll have tribulation. Jesus said you will have tribulation. But we know that those tongues that rise up against us will be brought down, utterly cast down. And there are promises in the New Testament that, that apply to that. Now, for those who are in the household of faith, if we sin, and we do, and, and we will, uh, we have to repent. And if you do something wrong, I mean, if, think about it. We serve a righteous God. If we do something wrong, we need to get beat. We need to be chastised. Why? To prevent us from doing even more wrong. So don't, you know, don't be so concerned that if you make a mistake that, you know, you're going to get beat. You want to get beat. You should want to get corrected. Why? Because we need to be transformed to the image of Christ. And God chastens, right, chastises, disciplines those whom he loves. If you have a child and you don't beat them and you don't punish them, you don't love them. I don't care what you say. I don't care if they came out of you and that's your only child and you love. No, if you're not disciplining that child. The Bible says you're not driving that spirit far from them and delivering them from hell. You are actually allowing them to become a son of Satan or a daughter of Satan because of your lack of love. God is love. And if God is love and he disciplines us, who are you as a parent to say, I'm not going to beat my child or discipline my child. I'm going to do the one, two, three. Did you hear me? No. God says you whoop that tail. You drive that spirit from that, from that child. Why? Because it's love. God, do you think God enjoys us being disciplined? No. But we have to be to help us to do our suffering to learn obedience. Now, Sadia is my sister for those of you, you all who don't know. And so Sadia knows how much she got beat and I didn't because I was such a good child. So, no, I'm joking. It's the reverse. Sadia knows how many beatings I got because I was, boy, I was out there. But you know what? Think, I, I think it, call forth Jesus. <laughs> I think about it. If my mom hadn't beat me, Lord, I'd be in prison or dead by now. Because I was almost in prison and dead even though she was beating me. So I'm telling y'all, when we're in Christ, be beat you. <laughs> well, you know, guilty by association. So sometimes you got to be careful about how close you are to people who are being disobedient. Uh, but those are great questions. Does anybody else have uh, any questions or comments before we go on to our daily inspiration? And welcome back, Grindor. It's good to see you. She pressing through over there. Yeah, yes, I am. Smile. Praise God. <laughs> it's good to be seen and not viewed. I'm telling you. Come on. Um, I've I've had some um, funerals that I've been doing here recently too, but I did want to say that um, one of my important takeaways is um, good is the enemy of great. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, that's good because often that's what we'll strive for. I just want to be good, but good can often keep us in a place where maybe God wants us to go beyond. Mm -hmm. being good to being great yeah. and a fear of success is a real fear and so um that was that was just very that was a good nugget good is the enemy of great and i also just wanted to um encourage sadia to say that um the word of god is the same yesterday today and forevermore so the same word that he gave to abraham is the word that we um are continuing to chew off of even on today that, you know, that God will bless those who bless us and he will curse those who curse us. And it may not happen in the immediate, but um, in God's timing, all mm. things will um, come around. That is good. I'm glad you said it because I had a point to that. You, we don't know how God is going to deal with those who come against us. We don't know the timing of that and we don't know the situation. But I tell you what, God said he would. And so we know it's true. And, I'm, and I've had this happen. I've literally had people punch me in my face and I was a Christian. And they knew I was a Christian. And they punched me because I was a Christian just to see what I would do. And I was like, boy, because I told them, I told God, I said, look, I'm not no punk. I'm just going to not let people hit me. That's not going to happen. I'm like, David, where my sword at? I'm about to cut this guy's head off. And God rebuked me. He was like, no, does your wrath work my righteousness? So it's like, don't get in my way because then you'll be in the way of my wrath and then it'll fall on you. So I backed off. I don't know what God ever did to that dude. I have no clue what God did with him. But I'm going to tell you this. God's Jesus in my heart wants him. I want him to be forgiven. I don't want him to be destroyed. I want him to fall in, in before, before God in repentance for what he did and not to suffer the true consequence of what he should suffer for hitting the child of God. Right. That's the love of God. He says to love your enemies. Right. And even those who despitefully are using you in the midst of them, despitefully using you, the Bible says to bless them. Right. Go ahead, Sadi. No, and to pray for them as well. Right. Ooh. Which really puts your flesh in a, a predicament. That boss that can't you get on your nerves, that lady that just, oh, that neighbor, God says to pray for him. And that's the other thing. The person you complain about, the question that you have to ask yourself is, are you praying for him? 
When I'm doing counseling, especially husband and wife counseling, you know, when they're complaining about each other, all you got to do is ask them, so are you praying for your husband? No, no. You know you're complaining. You're telling your girlfriends and your mom about them, but you're not praying for them. You're not taking it before the God that can change that. Same thing for husbands. So we're going to not complain. We're going to give before God and we're going to pray uh, for everyone. And just er let everything be done in love, the scripture says. Let everything we do be done out of love. And that protects us as we move forward. All right. So uh, does anybody have anything else? Uh, if not, we're going to move on to our daily inspiration from our church mother, Evelyn Booker. Good morning. Good morning. I missed y'all yesterday. But today's uh, March 5th says, make friends with the problems in your life. Though many things feel random and wrong, remember that I am sovereign over everything. I can fit everything into a pattern for good, but only to the extent that you trust me. Every problem can teach you something, transforming you little by little into the masterpiece I created you to be. The very same problem can become a stumbling block over which you fall if you react with distrust and defiance. The choice is up to you and you will have to choose many times each day whether to trust me or defy me. The best way to befriend your problem is to thank me for them. The simple act opens your mind to the possibility of benefits flowing from your difficulties. You can even give persistent problems nicknames, helping you to approach them with familiarity rather than dread. The next step is to introduce them to me, enabling me to embrace them in my loving presence. I will not necessarily remove your problems, but my wisdom is sufficient to bring good out of every one of them. And that's Romans 8, 28. Wow. Miss Avila, can you read the first two sentences again? Say that again. Can you read the first two sentences again? Yes, ma'am. It says, make friends with the problems in your life. Though many things feel random and wrong, remember that I am sovereign over everything. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. Stephen. So I can't hear yes. you, but um, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Your car issues, I will call Carl from now on. C A R L, and Carl needs Jesus. <laughs> what okay, does that mean? So, huh? What does that mean? Well, we're supposed to make friends with our problems <laughs> and even give them names. <laughs> so. Well, Carl better hurry up and bring me my new car. That's what I'm talking I, about. I know that's so. You know, we just gotta. You know, I'm so glad, Miss Evelyn, because it ties completely in with the word and it always does um, because so many times our problems are our enemies, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how right. they become big. Wow. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna start calling um, that issue, Stephen, Carl. You'll know exactly <laughs> who I'm talking about. Amen. No, amen. That's, that's, hey, that's my testimony. I'm gonna press through, but you know, one thing that we realize is that, you know, pressure, Trials and tribulation create pressure, right? And one thing that we know is true that the, even even the darkest thing on the planet, some something that people will cast aside, if you take it and apply enough pressure, coal becomes diamonds. The same thing that you can burn up in the fire, coal, applied enough pressure becomes a diamond. The thing that's the least important thing becomes something that is the most valuable. And that is what God is doing with our life. He's He's allowing the pressure to create um, something that will reflect his light. A diamond is brilliant in the light of God. And so are we. And I feel the pressure. And I'm, I feel the crushing. You know, there's moments where, actually, a couple of days ago, I don't know if y'all saw the video. I don't know if I was recording at the time. But we were playing our song, Yes, by Shekinah Glory. And I was listening to the song. We listen to it every time. But that thing broke me. I started listening to those words. And in the midst of me feeling like I'm being pushed and crushed and pressured as much as I can be, I heard the word says, there's more that I desire of you. There's more that you have to do and go through. I was like, I felt I broke down crying. I had to get off the camera. I had to stop the mic. I had to wipe my tears before we started. I was like, I can't be all broke up before I start the broadcast, Lord. But it's a real thing. And we feel it. And we're supposed to. And and like, like Sadie said, I got a new friend named Carl. 
that's that's Carl, <laughs> Claudia. You know what that Carl that acronym means? Uh oh. What? Calling calling all results love and light. Mm. All right now. That's that's all right. We're going. That's right. Love and light. That's what we're walking in. God's blessings and purposes, and we're walking in it. And but that, what Evelyn said, we're calling all results. We're confessing that. That's our faith in action. And so thank you. I needed it. That was by the Holy Spirit. Because even when she said Carl, I thought that was an acronym. I thought she was going to break that thing out. But yeah, Evelyn flowing in the Spirit too. So everybody everybody has uh, a revelation from the Lord to give here on their Rise Bible Study and Fellowship. And we love God's Word and we love you. If you not heard, have not heard that today, we love you. We are praying for you, those who are viewing us, those who are listening to our audio. We're praying for you. And I don't care, like I told you earlier, it's March 5th, 2022. I don't care if the Lord waits another 50 years. It could be 2072 and you're watching this video. We love you. God loves you. And we've been praying for you even before you were born. We want God's will to be done in your life on earth as it is in heaven. We want God's blessings to overtake you. And we want you to walk in the revelation of God because he wants you to know him. And he wants you to make him known, which is what the Arise Bible Study and Fellowship is all about. And so we're going to close out in prayer. Uh, and we're going to ask the grin door if you could. Can you? Are you in a place where you can pray for us? Yes. Father, we come before you once again just to say thank you. Thank you, God, for this opportunity to hear your word once again. We pray, God, for all of those who are on the call and who might listen to the recording. We thank you, God, for the seed that has been sown, and we pray, God, that they would manifest the blessings and. You continue to bless those who bless us and curse those who curse us and that the word remains the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. We pray, Father, that as we continue to go forth in your will being done in our lives, that we would give you all the glory, all the honor, and, not, and all the praise. Now, God, touch every situation that has been lifted up today. Touch even those who might have something written on the tablets of their heart, but they cared not to share it. But we pray, God, that you would bring resolve, bring order, heal, deliver, set free right now in the name of Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, look, thank you for watching today. We are happy that you're a part of the Rise family and we want you to come back Monday through Saturday, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Spread the word. Let other people know. Certainly share the link to this video with other people. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like, share, subscribe, give us a thumbs up. Hit the, hit the bell, you know, all that stuff. Uh, and uh, we will continue moving forward up God's holy mountain as we meet again at 8 a.m. We'll see you then. God bless.